I'm not sure that there's like 10 better stories in all of scripture than Elijah going up on top of a mountain and there's these prophets of Baal and they are they want to almost have a competition with Elijah and saying whose God is real whose God is more powerful and Elijah says this sounds interesting so they set up two different altars and maybe you know the story but if you don't it's in first Kings chapter 19 and Elijah calls down God to bring down fire on the altar that he has set up. And then he, the, the prophets of Baal call down fire from their God, Baal, who's like the God of fire, so it should be right up his alley, to burn that altar. And after hours and hours of the prophets of Baal calling out for their God to burn the sacrifice, nothing happens. And then Elijah calls down the power of Yahweh, and it incinerates the altar. And it even licks up all the water that was a trench in a trench around it and it was doused and so it shouldn't have caught on fire and yet God's power came through in such a mighty way. The, the, that is such a strange and important powerful story but what might be just as powerful is the very next chapter of the scripture which is very confounding. It says this, 1 Kings chapter 19. This was in chapter 18, sorry. There was a king named Ahab and he told this woman named Jezebel who was uh, a part of the, the ruling class and Jezebel basically gets mad because 450 prophets of Baal had been killed after that ceremony the day before. And in the middle of that, she says, I'm going to kill Elijah. So after Elijah's experienced the provision of God, the power of God, the, the firsthand account of what God can do, this woman says, I'm going to kill you. And all of a sudden, for whatever reason, Elijah loses it. He knows that God's on his side. He knows that God is with him. He knows that God will provide. And all it takes is this woman saying, I'm going to get you. And Elijah just has a complete meltdown. Here's what it says. Verse 3, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. He went to Beersheba in Judah. He left his servant there. So he isolates himself. He goes out in the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he would die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel came back a second time. Get up and eat. The journey is much for you. He got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by the food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until they reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. Seems like an interesting thing to talk about in the middle of a passage on spiritual warfare or a study of spiritual warfare. But, but, but I really think that for a lot of us, we attribute a lot to spiritual warfare when sometimes a solution is as simple as, are you exhausted? Are, are you in a season of little? Are, are you getting no sleep? Are you not eating well? Are you not taking care of your physical body? Because often in scripture, this was a solution. There wasn't really, there, there might've been the divinity of an angel showing up and saying, get up and eat, but it was bread. It was water and it was a nap. And so sometimes I think this is where I get in my life, where I'm like, all the powers of darkness are against me. And then it's like, well, when's the last time you had a good night's sleep? I'm like, I don't know. What's today? Tuesday? Mm, January? Right? So sometimes I think the solution can be much simpler than that. Now, I'm not saying that all the time it's that way. And sometimes spiritual warfare is a very real thing. But sometimes the spiritual warfare is that my spirit is weary. My body is weak. It's, it's malnourished. I'm not taking care of it. And you guys have experienced this in your own life. When we're not taking care of our body, our mind follows and our spirit then tags along as well. And so sometimes I think we might hyper-spiritualize stuff that might need to have a physical solution to it. Is it a weird thing to say that, 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 a, that a spiritual issue can have a physical solution, but our spirit and our, and our body, those in some ways, there's a connection there between how we treat our bodies and how we live our lives out. As the great coach Vince Lombardi once said, fatigue makes cowards out of all of us. So let me challenge you guys with something. If you're running at a thousand miles per hour and you're not eating healthy and we're not doing things that are creating even bodily health, but we keep feeling like we're in these seasons of drought and little and, and weariness and brokenness and hurt and pain, try, uh, in some cases, eat different, sleep better, create margin in your schedule, whatever you can, however it takes. Because oftentimes the, the supernatural solution is eat some bread, take a nap, relax, 
And then it says he gets up. Then he's ready to hear some hard truth from God about how there's a lot more people out there that are willing to help you, but he wasn't ready to listen until even his flesh was ready to hear the spiritual truths. Maybe that's just an encouragement, a reminder for all of us today to make sure that we're in a good place with our body in order to make sure we have a, we have a good residence for our soul to take heart and to take aim and, and to be solid in who God has called us to be as his children. I'll see you guys tomorrow.